We are embarking on a major element of its implementation, namely a landscape architectural design plan that will achieve the principles of connectivity, accessibility, integration of flood mitigation measures, restoration of view sheds to the river, enhancement and expansion of public space, good programming for all to enjoy, and linkages to our maritime and industrial past through history and art. The city is committed to achieving this while maintaining a strong respect for surrounding neighborhoods and for the overall character that makes Alexandria so unique and special. To ensure the planning principles, which I just spoke of, are met, the city has selected one of the most acclaimed landscape architectural firms in the country to help us, the Olin Studio. With our guest speaker, Lori Olin, at the helm and his highly talented and gifted colleagues and staff, the Olin Studio brings a rich and worldwide reputation. That was important to the city because we want and our citizens deserve a world-class waterfront. Also, working closely with the city and the Olin Studio on this project will be URS Corporation, expert engineers who will help achieve integration of essential flood mitigation measures into the landscape design. Tonight's meeting will be a, the first of a series of community meetings that will be utilized from now through June 2014 to give the public the opportunity to track and provide input into the design process. By June, 15 to 30% of the design work will be completed and will be based on the illustrative concepts in the waterfront small area plan. With additional funding and continued public input, the city will then proceed with the completion of those drawings in the following fiscal year. The meeting tonight will be stimulating visually and intellectually. Our speaker will be introduced by Farrell Hamer, director of the Department of Planning and Zoning. Then Lori Olin will take the stage and describe the philosophy that has guided him in developing award-winning designs for public spaces, parks, flood mitigation and waterfronts, and yes, we have built in time for you to ask questions of him at the end of his talk. Before completing the evening, Skip Grafham, a partner with the Olin Studio, will provide an overview of the process that will be followed over the next nine months for our waterfront design. It is important to emphasize that the purpose of this evening's meeting is to hear and discuss the elements of good landscape architectural design, and therefore questions about tangential issues or specific projects associated with the plan's implementation will be held for another time. A list of the upcoming community meetings outlines the subjects that will be the focus of those particular meetings. In addition, I would like to announce that the city, in conjunction with the Waterfront Commission, will host a discussion of the ODBC matter on November the 7th from 5.30 to 7 p.m. with the place to be announced. So we ask that questions regarding that matter be held until then. Again, I thank everyone for coming tonight and engaging in this process, and I encourage you to continue to be an active participant. Before turning the podium over to Farrell, I would also like to acknowledge and thank the Waterfront Commission, whose current chair and vice chair are Charlotte Hall and Stephen Thayer, respectively. And I know Stephen is here. I have not seen Charlotte. Is Charlotte here? Steve, wave. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, the Waterfront Commission is the body that the City Council has designated to help guide the implementation of the Waterfront Plan. Theirs is a very important role and they are showing great diligence and commitment to that responsibility. I would like to ask all members of the Waterfront Commission who are here to please stand. I would like to also thank United Way Worldwide, President and Chief Executive Officer Brian Gallagher, Chief Operating Officer Joe Haggerty, and Director of Operations Janet Wetzel for the use of this facility. United Way has been a committed partner with the city on many initiatives, including implementation of the waterfront plan, and we thank them. I also want to recognize two of our city council members that are here this evening, Vice Mayor Allison Silverberg, three of our city council members, uh, <laughs> Council Member Tim Levane and Councilwoman <laughs> Del Pepper. Thank you all for being here. And with that, I will turn the podium over to Farrell Hamer. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Farrell Hamer. I'm the planning director and, incidentally, a landscape architect. And, of course, as such, um, Lori Olin has been one of my heroes for a long time. Um, but without uh, building them up too much, I would like to share a couple of things with you. One is um, some of the projects that you may be familiar with that he and his team have worked on um, in New York. That would include Battery Park City, uh, Bryant Park, Columbus Circle. And then here in Washington, locally, he has um, done the, uh, the grounds for the um, Washington Monument, uh, the National uh, Art Museum, the Sculpture Gallery, and more recently, the Capitol Riverfront uh, uh, Canal Park on the Capitol Riverfront. Um, in addition, he is the practice professor of landscape architecture at the University of Pennsylvania, where he's taught for 40 years. And he is a former chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture at Harvard University. Um, just a couple of the awards that he's won. This year, he won the National Medal for the Arts bestowed on him by Mr. Obama, by President Obama. In 2011, the American Society of Landscape Architects Medal, which is ASLA's highest award for a landscape architect. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects, received the 1998 Award in Architecture for the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and this year in 2013, he won the Thomas Jefferson Medal in Architecture. So without further ado, I give you Lori Olin. Thank you. Oops. Hi, and good evening. It's, it's really nice to be here. Um, what a wonderful room. Could, for the slides, I know the media hates it, but um, I'd like to take some of the lights down because otherwise you won't see what I'm talking about. I'd rather be a voice in the dark with good pictures, if that's possible. Um, I'm going to talk, you know, Jean-Luc Godard, the, the French filmmaker, once had a title for a film that I've envied ever since I heard it. It was the title was One or Two Things I Know About Her, and this talk is, is kind of like that, One or Two Things I Know About That. It's about, uh, about public space and landscape. So here we go. Hopefully the lights will go down and you'll actually see something because you can't really see it this way. Hmm. First slide. Oh, I guess I'm supposed to do the first slide. There we go. Okay. Can we have the little dim yeah, there? Because I want to be able to see what I'm talking about. Okay. There we go. That's fine. Perfect. Hopefully, and if you can't see this, you can look at the other screens. The screens on the side are really nice and right. Oh, the mic's not. Okay, here we go. No. Now, can you hear? Oh, a little too loud. I'll, I'll try and talk quietly. Maybe someone can turn me down in the back. Well, let's talk about urban life. Um, urban. We, we have become an urban nation. We're uh, an urban population around the world, and just what exactly is urban? Because Americans have had a long love-hate affair with urban urbanity, and you know, urban means a lot of things in America. I mean, Alexandria is a rare example of something that doesn't look exactly like this. Alexandria still has a coherence, and it still has a traditional town form, and it has this wonderful waterfront. I'm not, I promise, not gonna tell you how it turns out tonight, because we haven't done our work yet. Uh, it would be crazy to tell you what the answer is to your waterfront. You have already done an enormous amount of work. We had a really nice workshop this afternoon with folks from the planning and Parks and Rec and uh, the engineers and various other people today. But the answer to your immediate questions about the great plan that you have already embarked on will come out of a process. So I'm going to talk about things that have to do with life in cities and have to do with the landscape of cities. Now, there's a couple of different ways of looking at cities. The top one is the way a lot of people look at it. They see a whole bunch of buildings, which is true. Cities are made of a whole bunch of buildings. Um, the bottom one is also true, which is how people like myself quite often look at cities, which is all the spaces in between. And all those spaces in between comprise the public realm. And actually, most of the public realm is in streets and has been for thousands of years. And it's why some of us feel it's too important to leave to traffic engineers, because it's where our social life takes place when we're all together, not just inside our little buildings. But you can't really talk about a city without talking about both. And to, to only see one is to miss an awful lot. The other thing about cities is that most of the buildings in cities are residential. 
we focus a lot on workplaces and institutions and shops, but actually 90% of all the buildings are houses. <laughs> You know, when you fly over the world and look down, that's mostly what you're seeing when you see cities. But one of the interesting things about the public spaces in between is how much they have been about some of the same ideas since classical antiquity. The slide at the top is a reconstruction of the ancient Roman city of Ancedonia. We call it uh, Cosa today. It's up the coast from Rome. About two centuries BC, this is what was there. And interestingly enough, there was religion, there was civil governance, there was commerce on a square, and they had trees and tree pits with irrigation and drains. Amazing, you know. Boy, have we come a long way. <laughs> it's, just, it's, like, it's like the notion of bringing some of nature into the heart of the polis and having important civic buildings around important public spaces that people could get together, the community could come participate in. So we have the residual of some of those spaces when we all traveled and go see these wonderful places abroad, you know, like sitting in front of the Pantheon, having a nice cup of coffee or something like that. That's a space like one of these spaces. So, so we sort of know a lot about those spaces. And historically, one of the principal reasons to have a city is commerce. And some of my, uh, I'm a good old fashioned arch liberal, but some of my dearest friends are good old fashioned arch conservatives. But one of the things is no matter whether you're from the lunatic fringe on either side, the point of cities originally was about, whoops, was about people getting together to, I keep doing that, I was hitting the pointer, to, to shop, to trade, to share things. And so these are photographs all taken in the last 30 years in different parts of the world in historic spaces, which are still being used the way they were originally intended. Other things took place in such spaces, ceremonial events, things of shows of authority, things of ritual. This happens to be the Place de Vosges in Paris before it became a park. There's a very interesting real estate development on the part of the king where he had this idea he'd make a lot of money. It didn't work out. He went bankrupt like a lot of developers were doing it. But, but, <laughs> but, but this is a great party. And one of the things, though, the notion of these public spaces still being a place where the city comes together. And, and some of the most stunning recent examples of it, of course, here's Tahrir Square in Cairo. The notion that there is a place when something really happens, everybody goes there. They go downtown. So this, the heart of the city still means a lot. And there are still public spaces. This may scare the bejesus out of you. Uh, we don't want public spaces like that. But the truth of the matter is, the center of the polis still means a lot to the entire region and to a culture. And in fact, we have more benign things that we do in those spaces. This is a typical festival of our period in downtown Philadelphia on the parkway in front of the Benjamin, in front of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. But what you see is a festival, the notion of people coming together in civic public space. So that's one of the purposes that these spaces have had for a long time. Commerce, socialization, ritualization, shows of authority and of, and of uh, importance in the society, and of gathering for celebrations or protest, etc. right? So, so I'm telling you things you already know, but I just want to remind everybody, this is kind of a 101 refresher of why are we doing civic works. One of the other interesting things that happened in the 17th century, even though the Romans had brought some trees in, was the notion of that you might want to create, whoops, with the, um, I keep pushing the wrong button, with the, um, the infrastructure, the armature of the city, that those, those great streets that I showed you, the, 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 the means of circulation, the notion that those might, some of them might become more important than others, and some might become even ceremonial or might even become recreational. So here's one of the first great boulevards in the world. It's in Paris, it's the 17th century, and the notion of taking the kind of Trees that used to line country roads and be by estates and that sort of thing. The idea, actually, it started in Rome. There was a pope, as usual. There was a pope had this idea that he would declare some uh, coherence to the city, and he would do it with tree-lined streets. Interesting idea. It spread very fast. Within about 30, 40 years, they were doing it in Paris, and they produced the first boulevard on top of an old fortification wall. 
And what happens is the people who've got fancy cars, in this case carriages, come out and show off. Other people are watching them, sitting around, hanging out, strolling up and down. So this notion of bringing some of the country into the city, but for uh, another purpose, one that has to do with structure, has to do with order, and it has to do with pleasure, is really kind of interesting how it happens and how it spreads throughout Europe. And then the idea that public, what happened, what began as uh, private enclaves for the rich and the wealthy, the powerful, the rulers, that these private gardens and parks end up becoming public. And that, of course, took several hundred years to happen. But by the 19th century, whether you were in Berlin, Paris, London, Rome, one would find places that used to be private enclaves with fences around, open to the public, and we find this whole new world of the middle class in public space. Along with the rise of department stores and, um, shall I call it off the rack clothing and man trade, you know, manufactured furniture, along with you know, machine tool production and the whole development of, of all the apparatus of modern life, one of the things that happens is we have the development of modern public space in Europe. And so these two paintings by Monet, one in the Parc Monceau, the other one of uh, Princess Louisa Square, one of the things you see is the emergence of public squares as they were done in Europe. And as we had here in America, in places like Philadelphia, Boston, New York. The notion of bringing nature into cities is really such an ancient idea. It goes clear back to classical antiquity and, the, and, and all that. But one of the things is that in the 19th century, this is Prospect Park in New York. By the 19th century, the British and then the Americans, then later Northern Europeans of all sorts, got the idea that they would build these pastoral parks that actually were bringing aspects of the countryside in. And part of the motive for it was health. It was about public health. Olmsted, who, with his partner Calvert Vox and a great team of specialists, produced this park along, right after Central Park. One of the things about it was they believed that people in the cities, the cities weren't particularly healthy, and that you know because a lot of the people in the cities couldn't flee to the country like the rich could, that it would be really important for the health of a society that you would have these places where people could experience trees, grass, fresh air. They could change the focal length and see at other distances. They could exercise. They could see people of other social rank and economics. And what it would do, with, it would allow the culture to be together in an outdoor healthy place. I mean, in Central Park, Olmsted even put in a dairy so that poor children could get milk. So the notion that parks are part of our health <laughs> and welfare in a city was a very big idea. But of course, that was in an expanding economy. The cities were growing. They're getting larger. They're building these parks on the edge outside of the developed areas. So they had room to do a couple hundred acres, a thousand acres, whatever you need. You know, they could build these things. But that's hard to do when you have a, an already developed city that has a structure. So the other model not the pastoral model. The other model for what do you do when you're in the middle of a dense urban place that already has a structure and form is you can develop something else. And so the French, along with others, began to perfect something that we think of as a fairly modern park. There was a, under, everybody's heard of Haussmann, prefect of the Seine, who rebuilt Paris and built the boulevards and did all that stuff. He did a couple of interesting things. One was, came up with, uh, tax increment financing, very interesting idea. You know, that's kind of like wimpy, I'll pay you tomorrow for a hamburger today. What he did was he said, uh, we will finance these public works on the, on the borrowed money against the uh, returns we're gonna get on the taxes for the property that's being developed next to it. We still do that, by the way, it's like revenue bonds, it's like the, things, the way you finance public garages. But so with this new financing idea, they began to build public works in Paris. And so they produced a series of things. And there was a landscape architect named Alphonse who ran a huge bureaucracy. And one of the things they did was they invented things like the tree grates we know, these kind of little funny bollard things. They invented 
uh, a lot of furniture that had to do with machined parts where you could do cast iron frames and then you just slip the boards in. They invented all, they invented hydrants, all the paraphernalia of the modern urban street. The street lights, the drains, the hydrants, the fountains, the trees. These trees, do you know what these are? That's underground irrigation for all these trees. I mean, they, they just figured it all out. And they produced it. And they brought in the irrigation from the distant uh, mountains. So, so they produced the, a public realm such as we are used to. You know? I mean, Pompeii, they already had curbs, drains, and gutters. But these guys invented the rest of the, the equipment that we expect in a modern street. Uh, in a proper city. And, it, and the people came out to live and, and spend time and socialize in these squares. That's the Tuileries in the 19th century, another painting by Monet, one of my favorite painters. Well, fast forward, and what happens is we have today, we're going to talk about life in the city that we've now come to expect. People will sit anywhere. It's really interesting. They will, they will do almost anything when they come out of the office buildings, they come out of their houses, they come out of their shops, and they will sit where they can be together and watch each other. And so here is noon, the guys are watching the girls, the girls are watching the guys, they're all kind of hanging out. But people prefer to sit in places that are pretty, where they are kind of lovely, they feel better. So they will do this. They do this when they can't find anything else, because that's all they got. But they would prefer an individual chair they could move and adjust, turn to the sun, look at the flowers. You know, so, so it's very interesting how people behave in these spaces. Once you say, OK, we've got the paraphernalia, now how do I live in it? So, and a lot of it's common sense. Everybody in the room knows how it turns out. It's when it's cold in the winter, you sit in the sun. When it's hot in the summer, you sit in the shade. You know, I mean, all that kind of stuff. But you need to be able to go find those places, and you want them to be in a good um, This happens to be on a sidewalk in New York. This is actually in a project we did in Denver many years ago on 16th Street, um, because you know, I knew it was going to be hot there. But there's another interesting thing to watch, and that is look at all these people sitting around the edge of this open space. They're not out in the middle. They've got loose chairs. They could go sit anywhere, and they're all around the edge. Very interesting. Why are they all around the edge? I, I made light heart this afternoon in a session with some folks from the city here. I, I, made, I made kind of a little fast and loose, a little light with a, a theory from a sociologist in Britain from a few years ago that I'm going to talk about for a minute. And that's a man named Jay Appleton. Very interesting man. And sometimes very profound things seem so dumb and simple that you think, oh, oh I could have thought of that. But this, this was at a period when Desmond Morris was writing books like The Naked Ape, and we were all interested in how humans are really, you know, we're just major, you know, we're like the, the biggest and most clever and most wicked of the great apes. You know, we really are primates, and we really are gregarious and, gregarious, and we like to be together and everything. And one of the things Appleton started to talk about was he started talking about something called the prospect refuge theory, which was saying, well, since we evolved in the great rift valley of uh, of Africa, of East Africa, and we came out of there and, you know, we had this problem with lions and tigers and that sort of stuff, um, that we tended to want to sit with our back to something under some protection like trees, looking out into the sun to see the animals go by and figure out where we were. And so we wanted the prospect, but we also wanted refuge. And that was our preferred place to sit. This is, sounds like kind of cheap psychology, but he had a point, because I've gone around since and noticed how people like to sit. And one of the interesting things is they do like to sit around the edge of a space. They do like to have a sense of something behind them quite often. And they do like to be able to look out across something nobody can be in and see the other people there. So you notice these people are sitting around flower beds. These people are sitting around water. But they're doing the same kind of thing. Very interesting. Brian Park, duh, here we are. Um, we, we messed around with Bryant Park a few years ago because it was a social sink. Uh, it was known as Needle Park, and it had its problems. And so we did a little bit of work there. And a lot of the brainstorming of it was a sociologist named William H. White, Holly White. And Holly had this notion that we should do a few things, which we did. We pried the park open. We made it so it was safe, so you could see, so you could do various things. But it was very interesting after it was built, after it was rebuilt. And I'm going to talk about other aspects of it. There's a big lawn in the middle. 
And notice what are the people doing? They're sitting all around. There's not a fence. There is no fence. They can go there. It doesn't say don't get on the grass. I mean, there's sometimes the year when they're reseeding it, they ask you, please don't. But what are they doing? So at certain times of the day, people hang out here, they hang out here, they sit in the back, they sit in the front, and they watch the fence. And then at a certain point, one or two people will go into the lawn. And once one or two people go into the lawn, pretty soon it's everybody into the pool. <laughs> <laughs> they all go into the pool, and it's sort of like, okay, it's okay. And so this, this funny sense of urban theater takes on another dynamic where the audience becomes the actors as well. But, and everybody knows they're a little bit of both. It doesn't mean people stop sitting around the edge. It just means there's a few thousand more people have arrived in this case. When we bought the loose chairs, which was one of my ideas, it, was, it works in Europe, why won't it work here? And everybody said, oh, they'll steal them. You know, New Yorkers, they're terrible. They'll steal them all. They'll throw them in the basin. They'll do whatever. They'll break them. Well, they did break a few, but it turned out we needed a few thousand more because we didn't have enough. So because, and we didn't, they didn't steal them really. What happened is that uh, everybody realized how nice that was. They, they had their own chair. They could move it, they could adjust it. And, uh, Holly White pointed out that when people walk up to a loose chair, they usually touch it and then they just, even if they don't drag it over here, they'll turn it a little to kind of, they're asserting their authority and their control over that piece of turf. It's really kind of wonderful, but we all do it. Um, people don't just like to sit around the edge. Some people like to sit in a more protected area. They like to sit under the trees, back in here. They're reading, they're talking, they're socializing. So. There are different people. Some people, are, as you know, are exhibitionists. Some people are shy. Some people want to talk to other people. So it, when you look around, you begin to see, hmm, there's people like this kind of space. There's some people like this kind of space. Ooh, this idea the library had. Let's, this is an idea that they resurrected from the Depression when this park was rebuilt uh, in 1934. And that was, and everybody's out of work, there's nothing to do, so the, the park put books out and became, the park became an outdoor reading room. They recently decided, oh, well, we could actually put books and newspapers out and people would come and read them. So what do people do outdoors, aside from walk and sit? Um, they watch each other and they like to eat and drink. <laughs> But what are they doing? They're, they're not even eating that much. They're just being there. Penn State did a study about 20 years ago where they sent somebody into, into a series of parks to find out what are people doing. And they found out not much. <laughs> they were really kind of shocked. They don't do much of anything. They walk around, they sit, they talk, and they socialize or they read, sometimes they read for a while. Um, yeah, some get involved in active sports. Some, you know, they jog, they ride bicycles, but then when they stop riding bicycles and stop jogging, what do they do? Not much. They just want to be in that environment. They want to be out there in the fresh air and they want to be able to see other human beings. How interesting. So on the basis that that seemed a good idea and on the basis that um, Holly White said he thought that if we put activities that were socially healthy activities in some of the depths of the park, they would draw more middle class people into the park further where they would shop and buy things like food and beverage. We, uh, Hugh Hardy and I designed a couple of kiosks, tiny, they're 24 by 24, they're not very big. And the food is prepared somewhere else, most of it's brought here, some of it's heated up here, some of it's served cold. Um, they don't have kitchens, I mean we do have health department licenses because we have you know, sinks with traps and we have electricity and we have they clean and all that. But they're very small, but they serve a lot of stuff. And I was delighted to see, I mean, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, they say, that the folks who did the Shake Shack in Madison Park, in Madison Square, uh, basically made a fortune <laughs> because they took this idea and said, well, what if we put out the best hamburgers in town would every, and they did, and they now have franchised it there in other cities, They're, they've come to Philadelphia, everybody lines up to go get their hamburgers. It's kind of crazy, but they, they, it started because they thought this made such a good idea, why don't we make our own things and just have a kitchen in it? And, they, and it's like printing money. Uh, people come from all over and they sit around and look what they do. 
This is not to say that parks are just to be cafes, but it's very interesting that that one activity in a big park or a little park absolutely produces a broad spectrum of people who come at all different times and make it very safe to be in because the lights are on, somebody's home, there's a phone, there's eyes watching what happens, people are picking up the trash. It really changes the, the place. Now, this slide is interesting because it shows the other thing about public space, and that is that, yes, we're social. We like to do this. We, we, we have a great time outdoors. This is also in Bryant Park. These, all these sites have been in Bryant Park for a while except that one of the Shake Shack. But this is the other thing that can happen. That man is alone in the middle of the largest city in America, and he feels great. <laughs> he feels safe, he's sunbathing, and he's all calm. And he's in the middle of thousands of people, which is very hard. Calm, C-A-L-M, C -A -L -M, may be the hardest thing to produce in our society of anything at this point. The notion of serenity, are you kidding? We're good at stimulus. We can really stimulate you but, and, and, and get you buzzed. But the idea of being able to go and just sit and be calm and go, ah. Oh, is something that happens in parks and it happens in outdoor spaces. Wrong button. But it doesn't just happen because you design the park and the park is perfect and everybody comes and behaves themselves. It also has to do with management and it has to do with programming. And it has to do with the notion of who's in charge, what should we have, when should it be. So here's an example from Bryant Park where you can see what's happening at noon and different times, what's happening in the evening at different times in May. This is one of the ones that I love, the fact that um, HBO, who have their headquarters across the street from Bryant Park, said, hmm, Bryant Park, well, we could do, they've been having jazz concerts there every year. Why don't we show movies? Because we are in the movie business. We like people to like us. So they started showing outdoor movies in Bryant Park. My favorite was when they did King Kong. <laughs> you could see. King Kong on the screen, and then you could see the Empire State Building right next to it. It was really kind of like that's where it was, you know, it was right there. So, so the notion of every Monday in the summer, there is a free movie. People line up and they wait until they open the lawn, and then there's this like the Oklahoma land rush where everybody runs out with their blankets and puts it on their picnic and grabs the thing and gets ready. And, and it became a problem because they were trampling, trampling the um, bushes and the shrubs and stuff, and so they tried to control it a little bit. But the notion of People having entertainment outdoors is very kind of benign. Uh, once a week, why not? You know, on a summer night, if it rains, they don't have it. So, so that's another thing. But programming, the notion of getting music groups, student groups, uniformed military groups to come and play music at the noontime, to do things like that. And then, of course, the opposite of this guy here on the right is that that same space is flexible enough to do that because it's so simple, and it's big. Karen Bacon, who's here in the office, and uh, not in the office, here in the audience, I meant, who you may meet eventually, who's working with us on this project and has done other things, is a master and a genius at figuring out how to organize these things so that, A, they really work, and they make sense, uh, and that everything doesn't end up in a mess. Um, but, but the notion, someone has to figure that out. So, my firm, my partners like Skip and, and others may be brilliant at doing physical design, but it isn't over when you finish the design. The, the, to have a successful public realm today in a society as diverse, pluralistic, chaotic as ours needs management. Someone needs to take care of organizing it. Now, there's something else people love. If they like to sit, if they like to eat and have a beverage and look at each other and talk and chat and just hang out. Um, they love color. We love flowers. We love this stuff. We love, we love the richness, the texture, the smell, the seasonal change. That's true. But also there's this problem that if you have a flat space and you put a lot of this stuff in it, you can't see who's on the other side. You don't know who's living in it. So we've, we've gone through a period where somehow or other for quite a few I would like to think there used to be this great benign time when everything was perfect and everyone behaved themselves. And it's only recently that people have behaved so badly. But actually, it turns out, near Bryant Park, actually, it, this, was, this place has always had problems. Prostitutes, Navy on leave, all kinds of wild events like that. But one of the things is that um, 
How did I get away with this? Well, I got away with this for a simple reason. There's a change in level. So we realize because there's an upper, this slightly, I see the little ramp, slightly elevated piece that was always a problem, and there's this lower piece that was sort of trapped. So we cut through the railings and opened it up so you'd, you could circulate and not feel you're trapped. But we also realized if we could shove all the stuff people wished against that ledge, everybody else could see over it and there's nothing hiding behind it. So the notion of there's these little subtle things about how you adjust the levels and where you put things that people want so that there's not some huge surprise of what's around it or can I see over it or not. So, so if you back up, they're actually, <laughs> If there's anybody there, you see them over this railing. These shrubs that Lyndon Miller planted have gotten a little tall, but this stuff starts out at the beginning of the year. It's down here, and they're perennials. They come up, and then they die back down. But you can see over it, and, and, and it's not a problem. See all these guys? What are they doing? They're watching. Lots going on. There's even kids. That was the other thing. The children started to appear in the middle of Manhattan. Where are they coming from? You know, it's like how did they're hatching out from somewhere? The notion that if you make these really wonderful places, suddenly they begin to appeal to more than just yuppies or you know twenty somethings or the affluent. Other people say, "Gee, that's a nice place. I'd like to be there too." Um, and then there's another aspect to this, and that has to do with what I'm going to call layering, both horizontal and vertical. Um, here you can see that and this puzzled me because these people want to sit back here where they feel they're kind of out of circulation, they're near the flowers, it's great, they got their back against something, nobody's going to come up behind them. And then these people love, and now here, see it's roped off, they're reseeding the lawn, okay, that, that's why they're not on the lawn. But one of the things to say is these people are all out at the edge, you could walk up and bonk this guy in the head, but he feels comfortable because there's so many other people here. You know, it's not going to happen. So there's this interesting thing that I would have thought, oh, that doesn't work, and it worked. And I thought, hmm. So when we did Battery Park City, I thought, well, if it works in Bryant Park, let's try it. So we actually put some benches up here under the trees in the shade looking out, and then we put some right along the absolute edge because people really love to be, and I have to not fall off, love to be at the edge. When they, they you know, Sitting back here, that's one mood. I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I'm back here, there's all that stuff out there. But when I come up here, I'm in a different place. And so people, some people really want to be here. And other people really, they want to be back here. These guys look really calm. These people are doing something else. Very different idea. There's some other things to notice in this. One is that these people, on this walkway are higher than those people there. You can't tell it from this photo, but we'll come back to that in a few minutes. So the last thing to say on that topic, I guess, I hope, uh, I'm not sure what the next slide is, is that um, those of us who are in this business of doing what Skip and Lynn and Will and I do, who are my colleagues who are here tonight, we, um, we're very interested in the fact that it's kind of theater. It's an urban theater. And that these people here are watching these people here. And these people are watching those people. And other people are moving through. This is the Spanish steps in Rome, which they set out these flowers. Now, isn't that interesting? Sometimes the year is just a few things, not much. Other times, poof, wow, it's really spring. The notion that you can through changeable things, change the scene. It's like, I use the word scene, it's like, it's like theater. These spaces, you, you decorate them, you put things through them, they go through cycles, you enter them, you leave from them, you know, stage left, stage right, it's really true. We've found that you can add layers to something. With, you know, this is basically like an amphitheater in, in, uh, in disguise. It's, it's at Battery Park City at the nose down at Wagner Park. And one of the things is that um, the, the idea that people love to look out to the water. This, is, this will come back when we're all together working on your waterfront. The notion that the biggest space is the water. That's the biggest room. And it's the one thing they can't get to. So, they, so there's this 
going to the edge, stacking yourself up, looking over the other person, having your own personal space. Notice how they're spaced out. It's kind of like looking at seagulls on a roof or something. They're, they're all kind of spaced out or they're together because they came together. You know, they're, they're in groups. So one of the principles that our office has begun to, I guess, has, has done for quite a while is we realize that a lot of public spaces are kind of mean. They, they only put a few benches out or a few chairs or the bench is only six feet long. And we said, well, wouldn't it be nicer if they were just stretch it, you know, make it longer, you know, another 20 feet, another, you know, get some more amplitude here, because that, that amplitude is giving more room for everybody, inviting more people. It looks generous. It feels, doesn't feel stingy. And, and it, it really is nice, you know. So anyway, we'll go on. Next thing, water. Even if you weren't... <laughs> asking us to come help you work on a waterfront that you've been working on for a while, I would tell you water is important. Not only all our, anyone here who's had high school science will be able to tell me how many percent of water we are, it's over 90%. We, we really are water creatures. We love water. And of course, a lot of the problems of the 21st century are all going to be about water. It's going to be more important than oil. It already is. We just haven't quite figured it out. But we always like water. And because if, if the stones, if, if, if the rocks and the geology are the bones of the earth, the water is the blood of the earth. Without it, nothing would be alive. All the plants, all the animals. And there's the same amount of water on the planet now as there was in the Pleistocene or in the Cretaceous era. It just moves around us in different, sometimes it's in ice, sometimes it's in air, sometimes it's coming down in rain, sometimes it's in snow. But it's the same amount of water. We're not going to have a lot more. We might mess it up, but it's still there. And one of the interesting things, this is Central Park, uh, a, a, a lake that Olmsted and Vox did with a charming little bridge. Um, this is a park that um, Sasaki's office did uh, in Manhattan back in the 60s. And people are just love them. They just love to go. And they love the sound of the water. The sound just makes everybody feel so good. And of course, when you're near that sound, you can't hear all the air conditioners and the traffic and everything else. It, it kind of other sounds are masked. So we love the water itself. It's this mercurial substance that's never still, always reflecting, always moving, full of light and color of the spectrum. So, you know, our office, we've done like this little paddling pond. That we, we took this lake that looked like a potato and turned it into something much more interesting in Houston at Herman Park. And, and now, Guys are out there, there's the boathouse back here, and you come under the bridge, you know, you come out in your little paddle boat under the bridge, and you go into this thing, and, and you go around the island, and there's the ducks, and it's really kind of fun. And the kids, you know, it's almost like bumper cars for the teenagers. They, they have some fun. But so the, the engagement with water, people, not only do they like to see it, they like to engage it. So look at what are these people doing? They're sitting, this is over at the National Gallery of Art, sitting on this, this edge, the coping of the basin we designed. So there's big jets that come up and make noise and splash and do stuff. The water shimmers and does things. But what happens is this, we designed this so it's like a seat or a, a sofa. So everybody sits on it and they stick their legs in it and they, you know, it's hot. We've done a lot of things that have water in various parks. These are all different things. This, here's the NGA, the National Gallery of Art again down here on a summer day. This, this is a project in LA we did years ago. And this is a fountain that I did where the, the water comes and it goes. And look, what, where are the kids? The edge. They're kind of walking out to see what it's, what it's like, <laughs> right? Where, and as the edge moves, the kids move with it. They, they just want to be there. Look at, where is he? He's right at the edge, like touching it. People want to touch the water. Recently, we, and I'll show this in a few minutes, we did a project in Stanford, Connecticut, where with working very nicely with the Corps of Engineers, we took out a low head dam freed a river that had been chained up for you know, a century and you know, was silted up in a mess and all that. And, and this is it now uh, in the park. And these are kids out there on stepping stone in the river. They can't stay out of the river. And it's not a problem. It's wonderful. The river, it's cleaned up, by the way. Here's, here's different kinds of water. People want to be on a boardwalk next to the water. People sitting. Look, the curb is so ridiculously low, and they're sitting on it to be next to the I mean, I didn't design it for them to sit on, but they want to be at the water. 
And these, these mothers of, this is at Columbus Circle, they've come down from somewhere, I mean, they live up on Fifth Avenue or Broadway and they, with their kids and their prams and they've gone right straight to the water. I've seen people washing their dogs in and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> it's just amazing what happens. They, people love the water. So water is wonderful. We love water. And to these children, it's magical. And I think this brings up the issue of children in cities. Because who are cities for? Well, they're for us. They're for us, and if we don't raise our kids in cities, they'll hate the cities. If we raise them out somewhere else, they'll say, ah, the cities, I'm not so sure. But if we don't make cities wonderful places to live and be in, you know, there will never be any countryside or wilderness or anything left because we'll just keep spreading out trying to leave the cities. So the only way to save the farms and save the wilderness is to have great cities that people want to raise kids in and be there and the kids find them exciting and stimulating. Now I'm going to admit, this is not in a city, this is in a great chateau, but this kid is absolutely mesmerized by the water. Well, can you take that in town? Yes. In Chicago, in Millennium Park, an artist working with some designers produce these fountains that have these wonderful faces that change. And I really like neoclassical faces that spout water, only they happen to be images of people who are alive today in the city of Chicago, and they keep changing, and they move, and the water comes out of their mouths, and the kids run around, and they can't believe it. It's really exciting. Nobody gets hurt, and it's a wonderful place. So one of the things is I've concluded, well, we not only have to make cities good places for folks like yourselves and myself, but we really have to make them nice for children because otherwise it's just not gonna work out. So then I think, oh, well, I was a kid. You know, you were all kids, what do we need? Well, I grew up on the edge of the wilderness in Alaska, so I'm used to just, just go outside you know, and go do something. But um, in a city, that's a little different. So the question is, how hard is it? Well, what do people need? Here's kids, all they needed was a space that had some boundaries and some turf and they're playing soccer. These girls, they're doing a kind of cat's, weird cat's cradle thing with string and I don't know what they're doing, but they're just sitting with two chairs and some string and on a path. These kids, they've got a sandbox. Boy, is that fundamental, you know, and, and, and some grass. So the notion, and the moms are all sitting around as usual, like the, like the nannies and moms, they're all sitting around the edge with the prams, the kids are all in the middle interacting. Um, it's not very fancy stuff. That, I mean, theoretically, there's pretty straightforward here about what's going on. There's an awful lot of attention put toward designing bad playgrounds. I think if I never see another red plastic slide or a blue, you know, tower that looks like a failed castle or something, it's, it'll be too soon. Interestingly enough, kids really are not as interested in that stuff. That's, they use it because that's all they have. But interestingly enough, kids will turn anything in their environment to their use if you let them. Look at this, what's going on? There's a sculpture, a very weird sculpture, and the kids love it. Um, this is a goat, a bronze goat in Philadelphia in a park, Rittenhouse Square that every child who ever lived in Philadelphia has been on that goat. They all know that goat. It's like there's camels, there's some uh, Ming Dynasty stone camels in Seattle up in the Volunteer Park at the Art Museum. And every child who ever lived in Seattle has sat on those camels between the two humps. You know, because it's, there's this creature and you go be with it and you kind of don't know what to do but you do something. And you'll notice that again, the, the moms or the nannies sit around here, the kids interact, they do things, bounce around. This, I mean, can you imagine our city attorneys letting us do this today, letting kids climb on this? That's the Alice in Wonderland statue in Central Park. Again, extremely popular, totally climbed all over, never heard of a lawsuit. This Triceratops used to be on the mall in front of the Museum of Natural History. I don't think it's there now. I think it's gone. But doesn't that look like a scary, dangerous thing? And look where they are. They're all over it, the kids. Um, the notion that children don't need what people think are playgrounds, they just want to be able to play with the world that you will give them if you give them a rich and interesting world, I think is something we should think about. Then there's history. A lot of people are... Uh, kind of paralyzed by history and historic settings, and historic places. Um, and I have to say, we take them very seriously, but a few years ago, we redesigned uh, three blocks of Independence Mall 
And we had a very difficult and strange problem. People wanted to build a museum. Uh, this, is the, uh, for the, this is the Constitution Center. This is a, a house for the Liberty Bell. And this is a visitor center for the whole region, uh, not just the National Park Service. And then, of course, here's the hall, the, the State House of Pennsylvania from 1759, and the original Independence Square. And one of the problems was all these, these different blocks the National Park Service wanted to put buildings on, and yet everybody from every building wanted to see Independence Hall. So it's a very simple scheme, really. Uh, it's a little People thought it was wacky. But what it is is all the buildings are, uh, are sort of enfilade along here. And there, but there's a rake to it, like a theater, so everyone sees past the other one. And then there's groves of trees over here. And this is when it was kind of youngish. But what it does is the problem was that Independence Hall uh, behind it, these big insurance company buildings had gotten built in the 30s and in the 60s. And, uh, and it sort of backlit and collaged against commerce. And it's hard to see it and it looked kind of like a mouse. And my job was to try and give it its dignity back and figure out how to do that in a modern setting. So one of the things was I decided that we'd do this kind of town gown thing where there'd be the buildings on one side and the country on the other. And it's this kind of American love of the green sword and trees. But then I realized that if I got, if I dragged the Liberty Bell all the way over to this corner over here, and you looked up that way diagonally, suddenly the building came off of being collaged. It was out against the sky. It looked tall and big again, like it was when it was built. It was one of the largest buildings in North America when it was built. And how to give it a scale back was to drag everybody forward and make them look from a certain place. And suddenly, it was very powerful. And you could see the connection between this is the bell, and that's where it used to hang. And sort of putting, trying to figure out how, how you can actually take history and get it out of being out of the bell jar and have it not be taxidermy, and have it come alive and breathe some life back into it. You know, how, to, how to be unafraid of history, because it's not really over. You know, it's still going on. You're making history. So we're going to try and do that. So, and then the space, as usual, had to do a lot of other things, like all the spaces you're going to need. It needed a cafe. It needed to be able to do things like here as a presidential campaign uh, where somebody's come to speak. All kinds of things are going on. We can see the media it's up here with all their little you know, communicating with the satellites and, and the world around. So the notion that these tidal flows of people come and go, and yet it wants to have these, these intimate moments you know, you want people to be able to sit under the trees in the little park or go into the ceremonial buildings. The notion that we have to figure out how to be unafraid of working with history, that, that we have to just go ahead and say, yeah, OK, open it up, pry it apart, like Bryant Park, like we did there, and, and, and uh, drag people forward and get them involved in the stuff. And so what happened at the Washington Monument was it was an anti-terrorist thing after 9-11. We were trying to figure out how to keep car bombs and truck bombs from driving, whoops, driving into the monument. And so among other things, we basically redid the entire grounds. I just ripped out parking lots and all kinds of stuff. And we started planting new groves of trees, as you see the little baby things here, and figured out how to get handicap up to the top and how to simplify it. But part of the idea was. People clutch things up. They try to do too much. They're always saying, well, is that enough? You know, where's the design? And in this case, it was just trying to make it be like the way people remembered it, which it never had been because it was such a mess. Uh, but one of the things was that we, we needed, I decided they needed some place to sit at the top because you've been on this long march down the mall. It's hot. People are tired. You have to wait your turn to go in. So we decided to do these benches. And then I thought, oh, but. We can't put backs on them. And they said, why not? And I said, well, I think the only vertical things should be the monument and the flagpoles. There should be nothing else vertical. It should all be just the hill and everything. And, the, and you, you, you take the one historic thing, and you really know how it should be set and framed. And then we'd also been discovering that, that backless benches, common sense says, oh, benches without backs is terrible. It's, you know, it's, it's uncivil. It's not very nice. It's not very polite. And, Blah, blah. And I said, well, hmm, yes, but you could actually lie down on them. They went, oh, lie down. Oh, the, the fear of people lying down, the homeless and everything. And I said, well, you know, but, but, but if you make it so every, you know, the homeless are uncomfortable, so will I be. And so will, 
So, well, you know, the people who have driven in from Iowa and want to, they want to be comfortable too, you know. So stop fearing the homeless and make it nice for everybody. They'll all be there and the homeless will be diluted. Don't worry about them. They'll behave themselves when you get enough, when all these people are there, they'll behave themselves. And so lo and behold, they do do all kinds of things like that. And you'll see some more examples of this. So this, this is by this work, everybody knows the High Line. We didn't do it. One of my students, Jim Corner, did it. Um, and uh, he and Lisa Switkin, another one of my students uh, from field operations, a quite wonderful uh, office in New York. And one of the things about it is it, it, what's the takeaway? The takeaway is don't be afraid of transforming things. Don't be afraid of saying, well, this, this is an interesting piece of junk. What do I do with this? You know, and, and there was this enormous fear on the part of people that the wild quality that had been there would go away. Well, now there's huge crowds there, so it isn't so wild. But they found a way. They found a way to make it very, very rich and very lush with the, some of the planning by Piet Olduf and others. So the, the notion of you have something, what is it a resource for? What is it an opportunity for? It may be a historic relic that you wish you could tear down, and the city wanted to tear it down and was planning to tear it down. So I don't know what the opportunities are here yet, I'm just starting to learn about them, but there's always another way to look at something. For instance, this was a five-way intersection in New York on, where 59th Street slams into the, this huge, tall building complex at 8th Avenue and Broadway comes sliding through. So Broadway comes through, 59th comes in, and 8th Avenue goes that way. So it was a mess. It was. People were afraid to cross the street. It, traffic didn't work. There were motorcycles parked in the middle. You couldn't even figure out how people got there and how they got out of there. It was absolutely a terrible place. And we were asked if we could redo it. And I said yes. And it was the end of the Giuliani years. And we had done an earlier scheme for it and that had been rejected. But we were asked back. And so I said, OK. And I had this idea that we could make a nice place here and that people would like it. And the idea was really simple. The idea was that Columbus, who stands on top of this, um, was a mariner who discovered a bunch of islands. He didn't really discover a, a continent. He discovered some islands. So I thought, make it an island. <laughs> it's an, make it a circle. First, it's called Columbus Circle. So first, make it a circle, make the circle work. Then make it an island, surround it with water, and then, hmm, the cars are a problem. There's all this traffic, so it's kind of noisy, and you don't want to see them. So then maybe we'll have to raise a berm around, and, but we'll have to slice through the berm to get across into it. So that's OK. And then, hmm, sound of water. Let's have some water going into the thing. So one thing after another, all the pieces began to come into place. And lo and behold, people now use it to cross the street. People go to it. They're there day and night. It's very interesting. You, people meet each other. There's, they, they have dates there. Can you believe it? In the middle of an intersection. Central Park's right across the street. Why would you go here if you could go to Central Park? Well, because it's a different kind of place. It's for different things. It's for different moments and different behavior. <coughs> and people do behave, interestingly enough. But um, what's the point? One of the things is that it's the water. The water is so sensual. The water is so beautiful. It's so People can't stay out of it. And we tried to make the thing as beautiful as we could. I've used the B word, beautiful. People are afraid to use the word these days. But the notion of making, cutting the stone so that it would be this beautiful, the stone comes down, curves around, goes back up to the other side, makes this basin. You know, the benches are these big, beautiful curved wood benches that make people feel good. Designing things that you want to touch, you know, when, when you put your rear end with your nice suit on, you know, you don't want to put it on a piece of junk. You, know, you want to have something nice. And so making the place nice, it doesn't mean it's always expensive, but it means it's well thought out and it has a certain economy of means and a certain elegance. And the interesting thing is, this was another one of my experiments with this kind of bench. Um, where people sit this way, they sit this way, they don't bump into each other, they sit this way, they're sitting this way. It doesn't tell you how to behave, but it does allow a lot of things. And the idea of the affordance of things, as opposed to the requirement, 
I find very interesting in public space. Um, seasonality. That's another thing we can do. These aren't great slides, but the notion that these maples turn into that suddenly one week. Holy smokes, isn't that nice? And then it's gone. It's just gone. And then it comes back, and it does something else. The, the notion of, of the vegetation, the, the world is alive, and it's changing, is very powerful. And we love it. We respond to it very positively. This business of seasonality is something that we need to figure out how to take more advantage of instead of saying, oh, it's a problem. Here comes winter. The, the thing is, in the National Gallery Sculpture Garden, here's the, the basin. We designed it so you could put dasher boards up, and there's coolant in it, and you can have this ice rink in the winter. So there are people in front of you know, uh, John Russell Pope's uh, National Archives building, ice skating happily <coughs> in the winter uh, in down <coughs> downtown DC. In the summer, they, sit or they jam this place for the jazz concerts on Friday afternoons. So the notion that it, it has program, it has ideas, it goes through seasons, it, it has different uses for different people at different times, you know, all sorts of things we need to think about. For instance, bicycles, rollerboards, uh, roller skates, <coughs> but bikes. Bicycles must have seemed odd when we started worrying about it. Uh, here down at uh, Battery Park City, people thought we were nuts. You know, well, that's okay for students at Stanford, but you know, this is New York. Come on. Well, there's a lot of bicycles in New York now, and they've got free. You know, they've got those bikes you can rent. Like you have bikes, right? You're in, you're into a bike program. So, but thinking, what are the surfaces? How does it work? How are the conflicts? Isn't this? Look at the sky. It's happy as a clam, rolling along there. <coughs> what a great thing to step out of the city and roll along the river corridor in that great space and look back and see the town and look around. I think an interesting idea. <coughs> I promised I wasn't going to tell you about how your, your waterfront turns out because you're started and we need to catch up and help you with the expression of it. But I'm going to very quickly show a couple of different water edge projects we've done only because I want to make one point. No two are alike. One size doesn't fit all. Whatever you think we've done somewhere else or whatever other people have done somewhere else is probably not what you should end up with. You should probably end up with something that is more about Alexandria and your particular issues, your problems, your hopes, your fears, but the place. So I showed you a picture of Mill River a few minutes ago. This is Stanford, Connecticut, the Amtrak and uh, <coughs> lines in the highway, uh, I-95 going through Stanford. Here's the downtown business district. Uh, this is the peninsula, the Kosciuszka Peninsula, the Pitney Bowes and all. This is a boat harbor. And this is the Mill River coming down through that town, which had mills on it, obviously. It was heavily polluted, was dammed, and was a total mess. But we've now worked our way through first phase, piece of the second phase. We're starting a third phase. And these pictures are mm, about three months old. It's brand new. It's like the city is discovering they have a river that they can go to, and they can go down to it. So it's, it's a brand new river, but I want you to notice how it, it, well, how it has, it's soft. It's not, it's in an urban place, but we're trying to do a river that feels more like a natural river with natural edges. In Philadelphia, our firm has recently completed a seven mile scheme for the um, Delaware River, which has all kinds of problems, as you can imagine, of earlier development and pollution and rotting industry and everything. So some of the rotting industry we see as an opportunity to do you know, habitat and wetlands and stuff like that. And we see some architects will end up doing some amazing thing on this pier. Um, but you can see that we're trying to stitch it back together. And it has some parts are very urbane and very tough and tight, and some parts are you know, pastoral and some parts are actually quasi-natural because it changes as you go along the length of it. Years, quite a few years back, we did a plan uh, with some colleagues, uh, with Bill Fain of uh, Johnson Fain, for all of Mission Bay, and then later we won a competition for the University of California, San Francisco, in the heart of it, um, that we'd set up the competition and it turned out we won it, but that was another story. But this is Mission Creek as it came out. And Mission Creek was a terrible, messed up thing. 
So here's a couple sketches I did very early to say, well, you can have an urban edge, which has some different layers like I've been talking about, <coughs> or you can have, excuse me, a softer edge that is actually quite hard and structured, but it has a lot of plants, and there's a, there's a walkway back here. So thinking about Mission Creek and what those edges could be, this one is built up pretty much as an urban, urban edge, but the other edge looks like this now. This is the soft edge. This is downtown San Francisco right on the harbor. So it doesn't mean you can't do it. You just have to figure out, am I doing this here and why am I doing this? this, this that was a piece of a park. The other, side, the other side has to do with housing all along there. That's, that's urban housing. This is a park. Um, Battery Park City, you've heard a lot about. But one of the interesting things is we started with a set with uh, Alex Cooper in 1979 doing a plan for it. And one of the things we did was we, it, we said, well, it should be like Manhattan. It should be a grid. It should come out of the character of the city. It should be all that stuff. But we turned the grid at a slight angle so that every single street, whether it was a north-south street or an east-west street, led to the water. Because it's all about where you are. It's all about a sense of where you are, you know, and, a, and a sense of place. And so as we went through different plans and different schemes, our office began to focus just on this edge, which is one mile long, and, and try to figure it out. And when I did these early drawings, which are a little, a little blurry, I'm sorry, but these early things, trying to figure out how to, on, on a relieving platform, do the outer piece here, this piece, and then how to do the upper part that was more sylvan and a kind of quiet, shady walk. I originally wanted to make it three steps up because I thought it was a better height. Every classical temple I've ever been to in Greece, uh, there's, there's this three steps and it's just the perfect height. Well, couldn't do three steps because too much weight. By the time we had the trees, the pavement, the police cars, and a few other things, they said, ah, you can't have three steps. You can only have two. <laughs> so, it's, so it's a little flatter than it should have been. There's another thing to notice in this picture, these lights out here. Um, one of my colleagues once gave me a, a very distinguished landscape architect, really ripped into me about, Jesus, Lori, you had an opportunity to make this whole new thing for New York, and you use those old Central Park benches and those old, the bee pole from Central Park. Why, did you, why didn't you do something new? And I said, because you don't understand. There's two reasons. One was. When we were doing it, that, that site was a big sand pile. The city was bankrupt. It was basically been taken over by the state. And there was a crisis of confidence that anything could be built there and it really work. And so I said, I want to make it look and feel like New York. That's the first thing. And, and, I, and I also see that sometimes authorship is important. Your signature, do something fresh. And other times, it's more important. It's what Ed Bacon once wrote about in his book, Design of Cities. He talked about the second man principle. And he used the the Piazza of Santa Maria Annunziata in Florence, where Brunelleschi did a foundling hospital. There was a beautiful little building with an arcade. And then the next architect came along and did the church and, did, and copied the arcade and did it so that he said, this is a good idea. I, would, I should continue this other man's idea because it will make coherence. And so in my case, I was interested in the notion that I considered, even though this was being built by a public authority called the Battery Park Development Corporation and UDC, it was part of the open space system of the city of New York. And I wanted it to feel like it was an extension of the existing park system that Olmsted and Vox and Robert Moses had done. And so I purposely borrowed some of their pieces to make it be a piece de facto of the New York City park system, even though it was being administered by somebody else, <laughs> because I felt it had to be that way. And that's why I use the hexagonal asphalt, hexagonal asphalt papers. The other thing was there, the lights are out here for another interesting reason. I lost this argument. I didn't think the lights should be here. I thought they should be, all be back here under the trees. So we had this huge argument. My lighting designer, I said, but if they're out there, the lights are going to be in the way. I mean, harder to see through to the river and New Jersey and everything. And this other designer said to me, no, Laurie, I think we need to put them out there. And I'll tell you why. And the lighting designer told me why. He said, we need to put them out there not because it's good for vision, but because it's good for people's confidence. They'll see the lights out there. They'll see them along there. It'll give them a sense that it's OK. They can go there, and people will be there. And then once they're there, they will be safe because people have gone there. He said, we need them out there to show that we're here. The lights are on. Come. This is a public way. So we did it, and he was right. I did end up having to put lights under here because it's dark under there. So we still have lights under there for the, to, to, to deal with that problem. But, but the notion of why you do things, uh, it has to do with a series of issues. 
So as, as it turns out, you see there are lights back here under the trees. Um, and people sit back here in the shade, and they walk out here in the sun, and there's this nice dog. And, but one of the interesting things is that this place can take zillions of people at other times, and then at other times there's nobody there, and you're all by yourself in the fog, and it's just beautiful. Um, so, so that every place is different. Okay, so that's New York. You're not New York. You're something totally different. Where is this? This is Long Beach, California. We're, this is like the day before the boats came. We just finished the construction. But I show it to you in this kind of goofy, empty, pure, empty way with no people. It's like, does it really work? Yeah, it worked. Um, I was very interested in doing something that had to do with Southern California, that felt like Southern California, but I was also very interested in, then there was you know, going to be this nice new aquarium in the park and all that, but I was also very interested in the fact that across the bay was the Queen Mary, and they were trying to get people to come down and feel good about it, and so I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we took the, the, the kind of teak boat rails, but with slightly different panels, that in fact, maybe I could find some bricks and lay them so they look like the wood deck of a ship you know, the notion of the, everything is of nautical in terms of its shape, color, texture, the idea that it's more like a, being on the edge of a boat on the harbor. And so it's a completely different idea. It's a little goofy maybe, but uh, it, it worked for them and, it, and they felt very good about it. Everywhere is different. San Francisco, we did this nice little park. And the reason for the park was that uh, Don Fisher, the head of the Gap, who had his headquarters over here that we were working on, wanted to give a sculpture to the city. He wanted, and Klaus Oldenburg, who's a friend of his, uh, and he had a lot of his work, he commissioned Klaus to do this piece of art, and we did a park to put it in, and then a little cafe down here. And so the whole idea is this is about a work of art, so this, and it's about people coming to be with it and enjoy it, and it's, it's an interesting piece of art, by the way. I just interpreted it for a minute. It's called Cupid's Span. That's, this is the uh, Oakland Bay Bridge here. Cupid, of course, being a guy with a bow and arrow. But it's, everything about it is the opposite of uh, the, the Bay Bridge. In the, in the case of the Bay Bridge, these are the loose, soft bits, and that's the stiff part. In this case, these are the stiff parts, and that's the curvy, soft part. I mean, it's, it's a joke. It's, it's really quite wonderfully, it's, it's Klaus at his best, actually. It's a nice piece. Um, a different waterfront with a completely different edge because it's a different place with a different notion uh, it was is Fan Pier in Boston, where we worked on the federal courthouse with Harry Cobb of Pay Cobb Freed, right across from downtown Boston. You know, here's the Faneuil Halls over there. And this had been a very big, tough, old piece of the New England Harbor. And we were building the first piece of an esplanade, hopefully, that would go the rest of the way on Fan Pier. And it had to be able to have working uh, water taxis and ferries. But it all, with a little ferry terminal in here. But it also was going to get big ships would come during certain times. And so this, this was a real harbor bulkhead. Uh, so we rebuilt it. We, we got good old stone and these great uh, capstans to tie things down on. And we rebuilt the whole water edge as a really tough edge. But then because we felt we couldn't uh, everybody was worried about people falling into the water and you know, Americans don't watch where they're going and there's this problem of liability. So what we decided to do was to take the actual walkway, an esplanade, raise it, move it back, set up some things, ledges along here, some curbs, have steps down. So the actual real harbor edge, the wharf face, is really a tough wharf face that's open. You can bring boats up. There's not a railing in the way for real boating. And yet, people are back here, and it's clear where you're supposed to be and how it's supposed to work. And we didn't have any problem with anybody saying, where's the railings? And again, we put the lights out here instead of back here. Um, but now, they're not between you and the water, which pleased me. So the notion of, and Boston is a brick city, so the walks of brick, but this is granite because you know, they have all that granite up there, which they built their wharves from. And interestingly enough, behind that, there's a park. And the, the trees are, you know, a lot of native trees and you know, white pines and all kinds of stuff. But what we did was people love these kind of pastoral parks and nice, pretty place to be and all that, but we have between it and the salt spray and the wind and the ocean and everything, we planted a whole layer of plants that are all 
native plants that are ocean dune plants that are from the islands and the coastline and everything like that. And then one of the judges who was our client, and this is the thing about working with the clients, you know, you, you really want to talk to the people because we had two judges, Breyer and Woodlock. Breyer is now in the Supreme Court, and the other one, Judge Woodblock, Woodlock, the head of the um, appeals court there, was really wanted me to do this and, and help figure out how to use all the local native plants and interpret them and have the park be didactic as well as pleasurable and, and attractive. I'm going to end with two little quick case studies. One is what my friend Roger Transick at Cornell calls finding lost space. <laughs> this is the first one. But they both are like that. This, this is a before site this picture, and this is an after, and I, can't, I don't feel I have to apologize for this period building here, which is a little awkward, but there, there's some really handsome architecture around it, but that, one, that one's an unfortunate thing of its time. But um, you'll notice that there is this paved piazza with trees and various things. It's where the monorail terminal used to be for the Seattle World's Fair and this kind of crazy intersection of stuff. It's called Westlake. And they wanted us to do a park here, and after having a series of fights about should it be hard or soft, I said, you know, you're in the squishiest, greenest place in the world, and you don't have a decent downtown square. What are you going to do if your baseball team ever wins something? You know, what are you going to do? You know, where are you going to go? You know, everybody wants to go downtown to celebrate. Whoops, I pushed the wrong button. How do I get it back on? Push it again? Yeah, okay. Thanks. Okay, so I had this idea that... Um, the pavement was like a fabric, and that it really should have something to do with the history of the place, but how to do that. And I, I'm from the Northwest, and I was very interested in a lot of the native baskets. This is a Salish Indian basket uh, made with um, uh, cedar bark and spruce roots. And I, we discovered that, uh, gee, that happened to be the angle of the square that we could use to make this pavement, and that we would make this polychrome granite pavement uh, all of, you know, this is uh, from Minnesota, this is Sierra White, this is a red from, from the uh, Rocky Mountains in Colorado. They're all, they're all American stones put together in this fabric because the idea is stone looks so good when it's wet. And Seattle, if ever was a place to do stuff that looks good when it's wet, it's Seattle. So I wanted this place to look good when wet. But I think you shouldn't feel that everybody gets dizzy in the space because one of the things is it's only when you're looking down. And designers have a terrible habit of falling in love with their drawings and looking at things in plan. But if you um, go there on a normal day, get down at eye level, a lot of this graphics that architects and designers do, you know, sort of disappears in the glare of broad daylight and at eye level seen in perspective. So although the people look like musical notes on a score bouncing around down there in the rain, when you're out there on a decent day and it's not raining, it's, it's not overwhelming and it's a nice place to be and they can have festivals and and the, the symphony has their fundraisers there. And when they have Seafair, they have big events there and all that sort of stuff. The last example I'm going to show you about putting some of these pieces together that I've talked about tonight is a fairly recent project in Portland, Oregon. Portland is a quite wonderful town. Um, this is the Willamette River, Portland University, Portland State's up here. These are the, called the South, these are the South Park blocks, those are the North Park blocks, and there was a kind of missing couple of pieces in the middle that had to do with odd real estate history of the city. And at a certain point, skipping the how it came to be, I had the, the privilege of working with a team of people on that little guy there. It's 100 feet by 200 feet, tiny. It's a half of a block. Oh, I pushed that button again. Sorry, excuse me. So, I was thinking about two or three things. One is, I thought, well, it'd be nice to have a fountain, and I can explain this fountain in a minute. And I thought, you know, I, because I'm from there, and I, it's always wet, but it's usually a kind of nice temperature. And when I, where most people have big houses with porches and verandas in the Northwest. And they spend a lot of time outdoors, but they're under shelter. You know, they're just, they're not indoors, they're just outside under a porch or under a roof. And I thought, why has nobody ever just done like those railroad stations in Europe with the big glass roof? You know? why, why don't people just put up a couple of shelters? So I thought, hmm, what if you put up a tall civic scale glass pavilion that people would sit, here's this guy in his laptop and everything, they're all sitting here, there's a little cafe, 
Um, and at night, you could use that to light the place. It'd be like, you know, fireflies or get an artist or do something. I thought, you know, those, those are the pieces you need. You need a cafe, you need a place to get out of the rain, you need some, a fountain, you, you need it to be nice in, as it goes on into the evening. It's very near the cultural district, near, the, near, near where the museum and the symphony halls and everything. So here's a little model that came after, fast forward through a process of working with the community. And we ended up, there's a cafe. Here, this is, oh, it's, by the way, I forgot to tell you, it's over six floors of parking. There's a parking garage under this. That's how they managed to get the deal. So we had to figure out how, you know, we do this all the time. We build over parking garages. So in this particular case, it's sloped all the way from that, all the way downhill a lot. You can see all the steps. Um, there was a garage that needed an elevator and uh, exhaust fans and a fire stair. There's another fire stair over here with more fans over here. So there was these tchotchkes were already in this thing. The space was only 200 feet long by 100 feet wide. And this, so I decided this would be the basin, and I'll explain what my idea was for that. So you can see the big shelter, the cafe, the terraces. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. I had this idea, water runs downhill. The park slopes. So therefore, why can't you have water squirt up out of the ground, run downhill, and then you just catch it with a little dam that you put a bench on? You know, so you just do this bench, is the dam. The water squirts. It makes this basin, this partial basin. People can walk in and out. They just walk by. Um, uh, if you fall in, you can crawl out. It's no problem. You know, it's a kind of not, not very complicated fountain, right? And uh, so these are interesting little models uh, that we made in the office. And then I still was, hadn't quite got this idea out of my system. I promise I'm not going to do an Indian basket. My colleagues are not going to do it. But, but this is Portland, Oregon, and I, I, I was still in the Northwest. And I was thinking, still had this on my mind, that the pavement is basically a fabric. And we had by then talked the city into the notion that the park was so small that the pavement really should extend across the streets to the building faces on each side. Because it would make it feel bigger and more seamless, and the cars would know, oh, they're coming into a space, they have to behave themselves. So in order to do that, it should be on a unit paver, because that's what you, know, you can make for cars to drive on. And I also remembered that the baskets in the Columbia River Basin uh, were these beautiful beige blondie baskets are so pretty and, and you know they're like fabric and, and the pavement is a fabric basically a flexible fabric so I said hmm. so we I kind of fiddled around with my staff and the associates and we kind of tried different things and we trying to figure out how to use herringbone which was the way you wanted to work the pavement for the cars and, and different textures and you can see I started playing around with the notion of what if you grooved the stone maybe in this direction or this direction or I don't know, is there a way to lay textured stone blocks? And so we did. We managed to find this biscuit-colored granite. It's very pretty. And we got these two patterns. One is a bush hammer finish, and the other is these grooves. And we began, and we worked out some patterns. And so that's the floor, and then here's the shelter. Now the shelter, one of the things about the shelter was a lot of people, when they make shelters, do them, again, this business of amplitude, they're too mean, they're too small, they're too domestic, they're too petite for the civic scale. So I looked at the buildings around, which all had these kind of this cornice level all around here above this high first floor. That's a very traditional 19th century way of building commercial buildings, you know? And I thought that's about the right datum because then it will, when you're in any of those buildings or in the space, the buildings participate even though this is there. So you're in a room inside of a room. You know, you're, it's, it's like when you put a carpet out on a lawn. Um, the lawn is still there, but where the carpet is, is a place. <laughs> you know, so it's a place within a place. So, so, and then working with ZGF, a wonderful architecture firm in Portland who are old friends of ours, um, with Bob Frasca's guys, what we did was we ended up with, and I kept trying to make this lighter and lighter and make it thinner and thinner. <laughs> With them, and so that, that's how we got to the wood. Uh, we got they're getting lighter, but the seismic folks out there, the, our engineers, KPFF, said, uh, <laughs> "You know, we got too many earthquakes. We can't make it thinner, Lori." But I was trying to make it more delicate, if I could. But then we were work, worked with a marvelous uh, lighting designer and artist from Seattle, and you can't tell from this, but what happens is. Uh, what Ron did was he went out and he photographed natural things digitally 
And then as he explained it to me, when he first explained it, he said, you know, imagine the bars of a jail and you shine a movie on it. So there'd be these things moving that are pieces of a picture. You can't see the whole picture. You just see those stripes. So what he did was he did water moving, he did clouds moving, he did grass blowing, he did leaves shimmering, and he made these film loops of that, which are cut up and you only get this piece of it. And so you can see the different colors are moving along. And at first I had to get him to slow it down because it was like, I said, too fast, people won't be able to read, you know, epileptics will have fits, you know, don't do that. It's just calm it down slower, slower. And I, I don't mean to be, you know, rude about anybody in there problems, but you really have to think of what can go wrong for other people who have different issues. But anyway, so we ended up with the lights in the pavilion, in this pavilion, you know, there's a little cafe, it's really nice, lights in the pavilion that are actually a work of art that is constantly changing, and people go and just sit there and kind of stare at it, some of them, you know, and I, I know it's Portland, but still. Um, now, with, within, within the overall square, which is, I said, was quite small. Here you can see the pavement going right across to the buildings. Uh, the tree wells that are catching the runoff that process it before it gets reused, the green roof on the cafe. You know, all this kind of stuff people talk about sustainability. We've been doing that for years, but we just, you know, you assume that's like architects who know how to do buildings that don't fall down. We should do buildings, we should do buildings, we should do parks that know how to catch water, take care of stuff, do that. It's, you shouldn't say that's what we do. You should just, you assume people do that. Now, what's the place like? You know, because that, that's the apparatus, that's the armature. Well, this, this little grove of trees is like a sub-room in that park, and it's a place where people play chess with this big chessboard we did. Um, so you can see some chess going on. People here, you know, reading, talking, eating, doing things, some things playing chess. So there's that place, and then there's, you know, it's not just for kids. There's, uh, people who live in the neighborhood, now a lot of people are moving back into town. This place has become incredibly popular with all generations, ages, lifestyles, and it's well managed. There's a park manager on site in a little building in, behind the cafe. There, she's got a little office about the size of this podium, tiny, but from there she directs the park and takes care of it. And also, um, uh, what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, and the other thing is that um, they, they, they go through different cycles of things. They, they, they worry about everybody. They, they look at everything. There's public toilets, kept clean. You know, the, imagine making a place and not having a public toilet. I mean, the first thing that happens when you take a child and you drive somewhere and you park and they've got to go to the bathroom, right? It's just it's what happens. So here's some things recently uh, in the park. There are kids running around in, in the fountain. Uh, these people are getting married in the fountain for some reason. Uh, this, this is the Portland Opera rehearsing there. I, I, I was looking for a slide the other night. There's a trapeze artist doing stuff from, from the pavilion. They have somebody like Karen who's imaginatively thinking, oh, let's call the po folks of Portland State. I want them to come down. Let's get the people over from you know, Pendleton to do something. You know, the, the notion that there is this park that's very simple, okay? only a few parts, um, well built, uh, this is the fountain. The fountain could be dry or full of water. In this case, it's dry. When we have big theater events, you know, it's dry. Here's the folks on the terraces. Here's the glass roof. The water goes down into the plants. It goes below grade. Um, and so here it is on a kind of quiet, normal day. Here it is on another day. You know, the notion of um, they, they just, the park department just came out, parked a truck with a big jumbo screen on, and everybody's watching the World Cup. You know, why not? You, know, you can do that with a space like this. But this is what it's like uh, a month ago. What happened was there was a heat wave, or no, two months ago, there was a heat wave in Portland, and um, a couple of summer programs at schools and daycares brought their kids all to the park you know, because if they didn't have anywhere else to go. They thought this was a nice place to go. So I guess the, the, the point of all this is that how you sit, how you see people, how you feel safe, how you feel comfortable, how you make parts that are well made. Uh, a lot of it, partly the way I'm telling it, but a lot of it is common sense. And then it's just figuring out which pieces go where and, and how, they should, how they should be. But it, a lot of it really has to do with how people behave and what people need and how they feel. You know, This woman, what her needs are, 
this guy here who's not part of that at all, who's doing something on his little phone. Um, you know, the, the notion of diversity is something I believe in. I believe that, uh, and my partners like Skip, who is actually going to talk to you in a few minutes, um, Skip and I believe deeply that um, something that uh, J.B. Jackson said in his refreshing of the Vitruvian triad, when he said that, you know, that was the firmness, commodity, and delight, well, he thought about it a little more specifically for Americans. He said he thought every American deserved an environment that was ecologically healthy, that was socially just, and spiritually moving. So do I. Thank you. Do you want me up there for this? For the questions? Oh, I forgot. We're supposed to be doing Q&A. Is that right? Excuse me. Uh, you're not done yet. <laughs> Sorry. But before that, let me just make one yeah. brief Please announcement, do. Larry. So, so um, the questions, if you will all write them on your cards, and we'll collate them and sort of combine them if you have sort of overlapping you know, questions and repeated questions. So please um, raise your hand. We'll come around and give you a card if you want to write it down. And um, we'll... Um, We'll ask Lori questions. Thank you. I also won't be offended when people walk out because I have students do it all the time. So I mean, if you're if you're babysitter or your dog or you you can't stand it anymore. So, I, but I'd like to try and be helpful. As we said earlier, we're going to try not to tell you too much about your project right now because we're at the point where we're supposed to be starting to actually be responsive to you. It's not cooked yet, <laughs> hopefully. There's all sorts of things I didn't talk about, but you know, you can't talk about everything. That's a great helmet. I really like it. Did you see his helmet? I don't know if I'm allowed. I'm, I'm, try, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to behave myself, you know, not, not be too obstreperous. I actually think it's very attractive. Uh, we had a great day today. I'll, I'll vamp for a minute. Um, what happened, um, my partner, Skip Grafham, who you're going to hear from in a minute, uh, he and I spent some time. He, he's been here with Leanne and with uh, Will Belcher before. And, spent a, and he actually used to work here and live here. Um, but we spent a good part of the day out walking on the site. And it was, I, I'll use the word stimulating in the original sense of the word. It was very stimulating. I found it uh, very interesting. And many parts of it are sort of what Bob Venturi used to say, what he once said about Main Street. It's, it's, Bob once said about Main Street, it's almost all right. Um, your waterfront is almost all right. There, there are parts that are you know, it has good bones, but it, it really, needs some work, and uh, it needs to be pulled together, it needs to be better, and it needs to just be a better version of itself. You want to step out there and think, oh, great, let's go there, you know? Anyway, okay, yes. Ready? Yes. Okay. What about public art? Public art, well, we believe in public art. Um, we like public art. Some of my best friends are artists. No, <laughs> it, it's true. Um, boy, we've done a lot of work with... Uh, artists both famous and not famous, and I edited some stuff out. Um, I, I think there's two or three ways to do it. You can see in that last project where it dawned on me that an artist like Dan Corson could actually bring us something we couldn't make up on our own. You know, I did a thing with just a bunch of dots. He did a thing that was a work of art. Um, we've cited five of Ellsworth Kelly's sculptures, we've done four or five of Oldenburg's, but we've worked with other people who are less famous uh, out west. Um, a woman, when we were working on uh, a project in Los Angeles, she got the idea that I was, we were doing these big beautiful benches, uh, and she got the idea that the backs of them, they were, they were made of a quite elegant precast concrete, that she would take old postcards from the site and arrange them. And then she did some telescopes that when you looked through the telescope, what was there now, what you saw through the telescope is what used to be there. 
you know, and stuff like that. I mean, she really, she did some wonderful things. I, I believe in it, and I think you're going to have it. You should have it, and there's no reason not to. The, the issue is how to get it at a level of, of wonderment and seriousness and, uh, and quality that uh, you know, everyone can say, oh boy, aren't we glad we have that. And anybody who's been to Chicago to Millennium Park, um, I mean that piece by the Spanish artist I showed with the children, that's one, but the, the so-called, uh, what did he call it? the cosmic bean? He had another name for it, but, uh, but uh, that Anish Kapoor did. It's, I mean, people are like lemmings. They go to it. They just want to see it. So there's no question you should have art, but it should be really good art. Not just what people say is famous art, by the way, and not just um, friendly to someone because you think you should be nice to someone. I mean, it really has to be good. You have to be firm about that. Okay, next okay. question. Yes, I'll be shorter maybe the next one. In a city like Alexandria, uh -oh. for whom do you design? Tourists, business, citizens. Okay, that's, that, that's a softball. <laughs> um, one of the things I don't design for, our office doesn't design for, is tourists. I'll tell you why. We design for the people who live in a place, for the families, the workers, the commuters, the businessmen, the people who are invested in it and who live there. And the reason is, I, I like to say, is because you know, a lot of people go to Paris because they think it's beautiful and wonderful. But you have to understand that the Parisians did not build it for tourists. They built it for themselves. <laughs> they, they had a fairly high level of uh, quality of life, and they wanted, and they, they wanted their, their public realm to be pleasurable for themselves. And they made something so nice, we all want to go see it. I think if you make something wonderful for yourself, people will come. You don't have to worry about the tourists if you make something good. If you try to design it for tourists, the people who live here will hate it. So I think you get it, you'll get it right, OK? That, that's my view on that. Okay, flooding. Flooding. We, we have major flood concerns. Uh -huh. How can you mitigate flood flooding through good design? Skip is going to talk about that briefly, but I will say that um, people have been mitigating floods for years through design. I mean, the way the Dutch do it is one extreme. Uh, but I think in this case, part of what's going to have to happen is to figure out how much water to let in to what degree for which parts you don't mind flooding. Like at Battery Park City, we designed it so that the Esplanade and the parks actually flood, but all the buildings, if you look at the maps from uh, Hurricane Sandy, you'll see that all the, there's, there's lower Manhattan's all underwater except for these islands that are where the buildings at Battery Park City are because we actually designed them to be you know, above the flood level, and yet we had other parts that were designed to accept the water. I think you have to say that nature is going to keep coming. We are, climate change is real, no matter what some think. That's silly. Of course, the climate is changing. And with the climate changing, we know sea level is rising. And you've been having floods, what, 100 a year or something like that? So you're like Venice. You're getting a lot of water. And you're going to get more. So what we have to do is figure out which pieces come up, what is behind that shelter, and how much more can you take on? And at what point do you say, OK, well, that's, that's, that's as much as we can do, because we're not going to live behind you know, this kind of big, great wall of China. So how do you design for it? You have to design to let the water come and go to a certain degree in certain places. And you have to design to keep it out in other places. You have to de Part of your problem isn't just the river. It's all the stuff coming down from behind you. you know, that's what happened in New Orleans. It was the back stuff that got them, finally. And that's what happened in a lot of New Jersey. So part of the solution, and there are, there's a member of our team, URS, are working on it right now and have been for a while. The Corps is very interested in it. The notion of all the, the watershed above you that's coming down through the town, how to deal with that in a way that that isn't your problem. That we'd, so, so I'm not going to tell you how it turns out because it's a very serious design problem, but it is being tackled as a, in a way that is a cross between hard and soft, OK? OK, this is a diversity-related question. Diversity, good. Yes, I'm concerned about benches without backs for older residents. Oh, no, you How do you address that? OK, I'm not saying do that for everywhere. If you were looking carefully, you'd see there were a lot of benches with backs in all of our parks and all of our public spaces. I really think 
The only places where we did those was in places where the back would actually was in the way of the person sitting behind who was trying to see out. Um, we only did it in a couple of instances, and, and we discovered that they were fun for a lot of people, but we, we have benches with backs, and I believe in them. I'm actually at the point where I actually could use them quite often myself. <laughs> okay, so fear not. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think, I think diversity in this case, I think there should be some chairs, there should be some benches with backs, there should be some without, there should be some great ledges. There, there'll be a combination by the time you, how, how many miles is this? How long is this thing? About a mile or two? Three? Three? 1.2. 1. 1.2, well, mm -hmm. depends. It's over a mile long, so in that there will be a variety of seating in different situations, and I think we'll find ways for people to be comfortable. That's, that would certainly be a goal. Okay. Yeah. A parking question. Uh oh. <laughs> Here comes. If several hundred parking spaces are eliminated along and near the waterfront, where will people park their cars when they come to the waterfront? This could be in any city, right? This could be in any city. Um, I'm not going to tell you how that one turns out because I don't know the answer. But one of the interesting things we've studied on other cities and places is that. There are a couple of places right at the very edge that everybody wants to park. And then within a two to five minute walk from there, there's lots of capacity in almost every city. There's usually an awful lot of capacity that people don't want to use because they really would rather be somewhere else. I don't know how it turns out. Sometimes we have to build parking facilities. But um, how to say this politely? Um, I can't think of a lot of really wonderful places that I want to go where it's really easy to park. Okay? Almost everywhere that's really great and you really want to be there, it's very dense and it's hard to find a place to park because more people want to be there than there's parking at that spot. It's like the restaurant. If you look and the restaurant's empty, you think, hmm, I wonder if I should go in. There's nobody there. Um, because there's a lot of capacity. But, and then you go by a place that's buzzing and people are on the sidewalk and oh, I'd have to wait. You know, be, <laughs> but that's a good place. Um, there is a problem with your, you have, the m nicer we make the waterfront, the more people will want to come, so that means, okay, what do we have to do? We have to figure out how to handle, how to get them there, and how to help them get there. And some of them maybe shouldn't come by car, and if they do come by car, maybe they have to walk a little bit more. Walking's good for you, you know? <laughs> Exercise, you know? A lot of people who drive to the gym and then run in the gym. I don't, I don't, I don't get it. So I, I don't have the answer to parking. It sounds a little flip. Uh, it was a little bit. Um, it's a serious issue. It's always a quarrel. Um, every city, I mean, every project we've ever done, when you have public hearings, it's always about traffic and the parking. And, you know, we're Americans. We love our cars. But um, they get in the way and they wreck places. And if you have too many cars there, you're not going to like the place. So. It will be a balance somehow. It will be debated. You're going to be the deciders, not me. So. Okay. Okay. Next question. Um, just so you know, our Waterfront Commission recently took a tour of Canal Park in D.C., uh -oh. the park that the Olin Studio recently designed. Oh and a question has come up about that. Uh -oh. <laughs> in the Canal Park design, you use the principles of sites for sustainable landscapes. Will you be using similar principles for this program? I'm going to look at Skip, who is actually part of the, he's head of sort of research and, and, uh, and some of the technology in our office. And one of the things is that he's helped lead this. I hope he'll say something when he stands up here. But my initial reaction would be, yes, of course. Yeah. But what, for those who don't understand, what that's about is about metrics. It's about um, when you do a design, instead of just walking away from it and not wondering whatever happened and not knowing about the things that didn't work, it's about uh, actually doing follow-up uh, post occupancy studies and evaluating uh, the, the success of it uh, on a certain series of criteria, which are you know, very important and, and, and interesting ones. So yeah, I think we would. OK. OK, that's enough. These next oh, two oh. questions, the final two questions, are about Market Square. I don't know if you got a good which, look at it. Which one is Market Square? It's right outside of City Hall. Oh, yeah. Okay. The one with the big square concrete fountain? Okay. Yes, yeah. that's it. Okay. That's yeah. it. 
the fountain at the National Gallery mm -hmm. is one of the loveliest spots in town in wintertime as a skating rink. Is a skating rink part of the plan and a possibility, and also a possibility, at Market Square? Um, I'm going to speak out of that's turn more a question because for... I don't really think Market Square is part of our brief, but... Right but, answer. But, <laughs> however, I guess it is now. Um, but uh, walking by today with your planning director, we were looking at it, and I said, great diagram, badly executed, um, because it's like a lot of what I showed you. There is a basin in the middle. You can sit around the edge. You know, it's, it's all that. Um, we don't have a plan to fix it, but it could be a much nicer version of itself. I don't think you have to throw it away. I think you just have to rebuild it nicer. You know, so. And you could skate there if you want, but that's another uh, cost item. And that may not be where you want the skating anyway. If you were to have a if I were to ask this group, you know, put up a map and give you all the red dots and say, on, along this, in this part of town, where, where would you all, where, where would you like to have a skating rink? And where would all the, and they'd be, they'd be scattered around, but they'd probably coalesce somewhere, and I'm not sure they'd coalesce there. They might. But that, that would be one way of finding out. I kind of pin the tail on the donkey. <laughs> okay, I think we're done, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that all right? Okay. You want my mic? Okay. Let's turn it off. Thank you, everybody. That really concludes uh, tonight's presentation. Um, we were going to have um, Skip Graffin run over the process, but um, it's, it's uh, on the website. And um, we will also go over it in more detail at the next public meeting. We have a series of public meetings coming up. So thank you very much. Um, thanks from the city to Lori Olin for such a great presentation. Um, that was wonderful. So thank you, and good night.